Okay, so I'd like to greet everyone who's here with us. I put the, uh, I, the, the number out there so people could join if they would like. And, um, and also for people who may join on YouTube, um, we're gonna discuss uh, primarily uh, Gideon Oselli's The Gospel of the Holy Twelve. Um, <clears throat> and again, the, the argument that I'm presenting is that people really need to read the Bible. Here I have a couple of photos of Gideon, Jasper, Oselli, Richard Oselli, right here. I'm not going through this entire book. This, and I, I will show you, this is the modern one. Uh, I have a couple of clips of, or excerpts. And you can find an older version on internet archives of the Gospel of the Holy Twelve because they left some stuff out of this one in the introduction that's very important for the origin of the text itself. Um, this book, it starts off with, uh, well, in the beginning of the book, it, set, it sets the stage for Eastern mysticism. And that's that's important, um, this idea of Eastern mysticism, which you will find among the Buddhists, among the monks of not killing any life. And it sort of sets that stage when it talks about uh, Jesus of Nazareth, um, besides his encounters with defending animals, um, I think, uh, well, he defended, uh, 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 he let birds go free. He stopped a guy who used his dogs to hunt and let them go free. He liberated a couple of cats. Uh, it's interesting because more of a write-up of Gideon Oselli, you will sort of see the content of the book. You know, he had a couple of cats himself. And it's interesting that he decided to bring that creature into the work. And some said jokingly, uh, Oselli, I was, I assume this jokingly said that the cats are his only converts. He was a Catholic uh, uh, priest, if you will. He was excommunicated or suspended because of his views. So therefore he had a gripe against the Catholic church. Um, but as I showed before, at the end of his book, where you might not find this in the um, you might not find this in the uh, newer versions, but you should be able to see here on page 166, verse 22, um, when he was allegedly giving reference to the council of the Messiah, uh, he argued, he said, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So this is what they believe. Now in the newer versions, they don't use the word Catholic. Uh, they use universal and the people never, um, uh, in verse 21 of the newer versions, it says, we believe in one holy universal and apostolic church. Well, some people read and might not know what universal church mean, but we, you know, we had learned through time well, as Catholic. So when I first seen it, I said, man, he's talking about the Catholic church. And then when I got to the end of the work, yes, he just come right out and say it in the older versions. Uh, but, but as I was saying about the Eastern mysticism, um, he has, this idea, this Jesus of Nazareth, the historical Jesus of Nazareth, he had visited, um, he said he went, and this would be uh, chapter six. If anyone have any questions or comments, I sort of just jump right in this. So this will be chapter six. Um, and again, peace to all of the people who may be listening to us on YouTube. I am able to glance over there. Peace. Shalom to you, Sister Wanda. And again, this is uh, pretty much bringing information together about this book 
they entitle the gospel of the Holy 12 and um, people promoting uh, veganism. Uh, but before I get into Oselli, I just want to give more of a background here in section six, starting at verse um, 13. It argues that Jesus himself was married. He said in the 18th year of his age, Jesus was espoused to marry him a virgin of the tribe of Judah with whom he lived seven years. But it says she had passed away. But nevertheless, at 18 years old, he was supposed to have gotten married. But I want to get down to something else. And it says, and Jesus, after that, he had finished his study of the law, went down again into Egypt that he might learn the wisdom of the Egyptians. And I'm skipping a little bit and obtained the power of the holy name by which he wrought many miracles. Uh, that's difficult to argue as well, uh, because um, we argue here that the Messiah didn't do any miracles until the time of his ministry. And one uh, reason why we take that position is because to the people in his hometown, he was just a regular man. In fact, it was hard for him to do miracles in his hometown because they didn't believe he was anybody special. But if he came doing works like a lot of the Protestant books imply, then I don't think it would have been difficult for them to even believe that he was uh, uh, some sort of prophet or a uh, special man, but he didn't do that. But nevertheless, he went down into Egypt. Then it says here, he learned the language of birds and beasts and the healing powers of trees and herbs and flowers and the hidden secrets of precious stones. And he learned the motions of the sun and the moon and the stars. So you said from learning astrology to learning the, the secrets of the precious stones and of herbs and flowers and the language, notice what else he's gonna explain. He said, and he learned the mysteries of the square and the circle and the transmutation of things and of forms and of numbers and of signs. From thence he returned to Nazareth to visit his parents and he taught there in Jerusalem as an accepted rabbi. Even in the temple, none hindering him. And after a time he went to Assyria, this will sort of argue the point of learning about the sun, moon and the stars. He went to Assyria, he went to India. So when he's going to Assyria and to India, he's traveling east to India and into Persia and into the land of the Chaldees. And he visited their temples. Yes, the temples of the Persians, Indians and Assyrians, East Indians. He visited their temples and conversed with their priests and their wise men for many years, doing many wonderful works, healing the sick, as he passed through their countries and the beast of the field had respect unto him and the birds of the air were in no fear of him. And in fact, that argues that the fear itself, um, the fear of the dread of animals has to do with the subduing and the, uh, 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 having dominion and subduing. But I read this part to show why uh, uh, um, Oselli is going to introduce this, this idea of Eastern mysticism. Now, Oselli himself, I'm going to look into this. Again, who, we're making reference to this guy here with the Star of David and a cross in the middle. This, this, this guy here, Reverend Gideon Jasper Oselli. And I would say one thing is, again, to be fair, they took it out of the newer versions. But if you want the older one, you go on internet archives. And you may ask brother Judah, what are you saying they took out of the newer versions? This, where did this book come from? And what's amazing to me is that people will discredit the Bible or the text we have today 
and say that the Bible is corrupted, but they accept this garbage. This garbage. Uh, mean in the context of anything being inspired. Now, if you want to read something like to understand different thoughts and, and different arguments, that's different. But when it comes down to just establishing this as some sort of scripture, no, no, not at all. So the introduction of the older books, it, don't, it doesn't have it in a new book. So this is the introduction in the older books of the writing of the gospel of the Holy 12. And it says the Reverend G.J. Oselli, by which this gospel was written down, was a son of Sir Calf Oselli. And was born, notice his date. He was born in 1835 and died in 1906. Now, I want you to remember those dates because I want to show you something here. Oselli himself is from 1805. I mean, excuse me, 1835. 1835 to 1906. He was a priest first in the established Church of Ireland and afterwards in the Catholic Apostolic Church. So therefore, this ex explains why in his gospel of the Holy Twelve, in his gospel of the Holy Twelve, as we read earlier, in the last pages, I think it was, uh, that should have been page, um, or should I say chapter, uh, 91, Oselli says uh, on page 166 in the older edition, but it's chapter 91, uh, verse 21. We believe in one holy Catholic apostolic church, the witness of all or the witness to all truth. The receiver and giver of the same, gotten of the spirit or begotten of the spirit and fire of God, nourished by the waters, seeds and fruits of the earth. Who by the spirit of life, by her 12 books and sacraments, her holy words and works knitteth together the, knitteth together the elect in one mystical communion. But nevertheless, here we see he's arguing about his that about this Holy 12. Now, back to the introduction. He was a member of the Catholic Apostolic Church and he argued that this text originally uh, was supposed to have come from a um, monastery that was allegedly, uh, it was in Tibet and some of the Essenes were supposed to have taken this manuscript to Tibet and hide it in a, a, a monastery of, of monks. Now, you all may be familiar with some of our teachings where we explain that when we look from the political side, we argue that the monks uh, were an aristocratic class of people who joined on to the feudal order of the papacy. And they had um, pretty much a, a bunch of land and resources and a lot of rich people would give to the monks. Um, and um, some would give their lands and wealth to the monastery order for retirement. And so some would, if you don't research it, you would think the monk, the monks are in order or the monasteries are in order of poor people. Yeah, they have taken on voluntary poverty, yeah. But no, they bread and butter was provided all the time. They had a place to stay, they had lands. They would study Plato, they would study Socrates instruments. Poor people didn't do that. 
So the monasteries were actually a reservoir for retired or young, uh, rich, aristocratic children who um, was given to the monastery uh, to follow their orders. But it really didn't have anything to do with the poor. And you may wonder why I'm talking about the monastery, because before I go further in reading this introduction, I want to go to a text entitled The Last Two Million Years of Man by Reader's Digest. And so maybe this could put this in perspective. Uh, and um, page 217, subtitle Growth of the Monasteries. It reads, and we're going to look at one guy here that was a disciple of Benedict. And according to Ocelli, he received the revelation for this work after he couldn't produce the manuscripts out of Tibet, the original um, Aramaic, it's going to explain where he got his version from. And that's what makes it even more suspect, but that because because they don't put it in the newer versions. They don't put it in here. So people who got this one that you buy online on YouTube or, or on uh, Amazon, you don't have this introduction. And I believe they left it out on purpose, but we're gonna look at Benedict. But what we're looking at is in uh, 529, Benedict drew up his rule or regular, which was gradually adopted by most monasteries in the West. The regular required the monks to take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. So keep this in mind, poverty, yeah, but really they were all taken care of because they lived on the rich feudal lands of the papacy, all right? So they, um, they, uh, they followed this chastity and obedience in their monasteries, uh, was organized as a family under the abbot. The word comes from the Greek abbas, meaning father. Life in the sixth and seventh century monasteries were severe, but not harsh, being divided between sleeping, working, and praying. The monks had a pound of bread, two cooked dishes, and a measure of wine each day, though eating meat was forbidden. Uh, you could take this argument of vegetarianism and not eating meat all the way back to the Greeks, but we're not going that far back. But the, remember, the monastery said that the eating meat was forbidden. And remember who drew up this rule. It was Benedict. Now, if we go back here to this introduction inside of the older copy of the Go Ocelli's Gospel of the Holy Twelve, it says the third edition and last before the present one appeared in or about 1902 and contained a preface in which Mr. Ocelli said that the gospel had been received by him in numerous fragments at different times. Notice who he, no, notice who he said he's receiving these gospels fragments from. Emmanuel, from Emmanuel Swedenborg, watch this, who was seen by trustworthy clairvoyance and afterwards identified from a portrait shown to them. Why did Emmanuel Swedenborg had to be identified by clairvoyancy or necromancy? Ocelli was born in 1835. He died in 1906. He said he received this gospel from Emmanuel Swedenborg. I'm a little familiar with Emmanuel Swedenborg. But I'm gonna read the encyclopedia to you. That's why I'm saying, if you're gonna read a work for the, cause I read, I do, I, I, I research different work. That's how you learn. But soon as you're talking about some book that's going to move out or stand on the same par as the Tanakh or the Apostles, then, it, then, then automatically you, you're talking garbage. 
Now this man was supposed to receive this uh, fragments of gospel, the gospel of the Holy Twelve in fragments from Emmanuel Swedenborg, but in parentheses it said he was identified through clairvoyance. Why? Because Emmanuel Swedenborg, he lived in, eight, in 1688 and died in 1772. Oselli never met the man. So he can say, he's saying that he, through visions, through the spirit, you know how everybody, when they want to get outside the Bible, they want to talk about what the spirit done revealed to them. I'm telling you when somebody coming on your platform talking about what the spirit done revealed to them and you can't read it in a book, you can't, you better try that spirit by the spirit. And if that spirit don't line up, then we know it don't match. And we know we're going to try it. We're going to try the spirit by the spirit. Because he's claiming he received this work by way of the spirit. Swedenborg was dead. So it had to go through clairvoyancy or those who dealing with necromancy to receive this vision of this book. You want to question the Bible. But how much research did these Jakes running around here? I've heard it for some time. I've seen it for some years back. They running on this platform. and, and and they want to question the Bible. Where the hell does this come from? Where does this thing come from? I'm talking about some damn Emmanuel Swedenborg you received. It. Who was he? A Swedish scientist. And what? A Christian mystic and philosopher. Yes, he was a mystic. I'm familiar with some of his stuff. Now, Swedenborg, 1688 to 1772, never met. Owsley or Oselli. Never met him. So we got to go back to this third edition. Oselli said that the gospel had been received by him in numerous fragments at different times from Emmanuel Swedenborg, who was seen by trustworthy clairvoyance. Who were they? Anna Kingsford, Edward Maitland, and a great priest of a former century. Now, these two people lived. They were his contemporaries, uh, Oselli, Anna Kingsford, and Edward, Edward Maitland. Uh, but now, not only did they add Swedenborg, who didn't live during that time, so they had to communicate basically with his ghost. But what we also have here, they said, and afterwards, after I identified a portrait, it was shown of them. So they, they found out whoever they were seeing in their dreams and in their visions or in the spirit, they found out, oh, this was Emmanuel Swedenborg. But they didn't stop there. And a priest of a former century giving his name as Placidius or, yeah, Placidius. Who was he? You see, they said a former century. They didn't tell you what century. Placidius, who is he? Another ghost they communicated with. Who the hell is he? Excuse me, French. Who is he? Placidius died in the sixth century. In fact, they named a holiday after him. He died in, 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 in uh, he, and Placidius, St. Placidius, also known as St. Placid, was a disciple of St. Benedict. Who is Benedict? Benedict was the one that drew up the rule in the monastery. Placidius, in whom they communicated with his spirit to receive portions of this so-called gospel of the Holy Twelve, Oselli's gospel of the Holy Twelve, well, one of the priests that they communicated with in the former century was none other than St. Placidius, who was a disciple of St. Benedict and last two million years is said in 529, the sixth century, Benedict drew up his rule or regular, which was gradually adopted by most monasteries in the West. And it all ended with this. The monks had a pound of bread, two cooked dishes and a measure of wine each day, though eating meat was forbidden. Now we get into the political order of the monks so we could get more into it, but we're not doing that today. That's not our purpose in doing that today. 
I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of um, Timothy. I want to go to the book of Timothy. First Timothy. First Timothy. And, and, and people could get upset and whatever, don't make me no difference. At the end of the day, a man could tell his dream. A man, just like he told by the prophet Jeremiah, if you got a dream, let a man tell his dream, let, let him do all that. But he that got the word of Elohim, let him speak that faithfully. And I say it, and I say it, I am, uh, uh, that's, that's the platform I run on. Uh, as far as all these people being guided by the spirit, I heard all that growing up. And I heard so many people being led by the spirit and new revelations. In fact, they was receiving, even they, I've heard people go against the prophets and say that the prophets didn't know what they was talking about because it was in the Old Testament. But now they are receiving new revelation for Jesus Christ. I see, I know, the, I, I know that I'm in the presence of somebody foolish. And at the end of the day, they all have these conflict, conflicting revelations. But call me old fashioned. I'm going to stick with the text. He that hath his word, let him speak that faith. And what we got here with the Apostle Saul, he wrote to Timothy. And we do have these aristocrats and the growth of the feudal order under the papacy. They had another aristocratic order receiving wealth and lands. And you have these monks studying Plato and drinking wine and bread. But they couldn't eat meat under the, under, under the Benedict order. All didn't accept that order, just the Benedict order. So you have some monks, they, ain't, they, they was eating whatever they, they was provided to them. But in First Timothy, and they were provided for well. If you study in Plato and playing instruments, you provide it for a well. Just decide to start, research the monks. You will realize these are a bunch of aristocrats. In fact, it says here about St. Pl uh, 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 Placidus. What does it say about St. Placidus? Look at this right off the bat so you will know what I'm talking about. He was the son of a patrician, Tertullus was brought as a child to St. Benedict's and Subloquine. The patrician, they were the ruling class in the Roman Catholic Empire. That's who the patricians were. And just as I studied on the monks, Placidus would have been one of the children who was sent to the monasteries for learning, Plato and for discipline, for learning the Greek philosophers. This was an aristocratic order. That's what it was. But nevertheless, my point being is that Ocelli never met Placidus. He never met Swedenborg. So the very foundations of this work is built on a form of craft, if you will, necromancy. They say they communicated with them to receive this book. Now we know why they're communicating with Benedict. Why? Because Benedict said, don't eat no meat. So therefore, this is what Placid is coming. Or Placidus. First Timothy chapter four, verses one. Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And that's what they do. And if they heard anybody, if Ocelli were, was receiving any, any, any kind of visions or any, anything, he was receiving doctrines of devils. If you claim that you communi communicated with uh, 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 Emmanuel Swedenborg and uh, a, a, a priest that died in the sixth century and Emmanuel Swedenborg that died in 1772, and you born in 1885, was it? 1835? You dealing with seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They done told you in this book, the Messiah went and dwelt in the temples of Assyria. He dwelt in the temples of India. 
That's what we read. That's that's the very how very first start to lay the foundation. He was married at 18, and the Messiah wasn't the according to Oselli's writing or the writings he received from the necromancing of or the clairvoyance of faithful clairvoyance of Emmanuel Swedenborg. They say the Messiah did, he didn't he didn't lead his earth. He didn't die till he was 49 years old. We're not going through the whole book. I'm just bringing some things out that people really arguing over this. They really arguing over this. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. That's all it is. A bunch of lies in this text. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats or food which Elohim or God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. And that's what this book is about. Whether it's the uh, Essene Gospel of Peace, and if you got an older version, because before this was called the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, I think it was called the Gospel of the Nazarenes. That was the earlier title of the same work. Forbidding the Mary and commanding to abstain from meats. Now watch this part. Look what it said about marrying. It starts off in the beginning. The temptations of the Messiah. We know in the Gospels we had, he was tempted by riches. He was tempted to jump off the, the, the uh, 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 pinnacle of the temple as a sign. He was tempted to turn bread or turn stones into bread. But that wasn't enough for Oselli. Whatever spirits was communicating with him, to give him this work, the third edition, the last before the present one appeared in or about 1902 and contained a preface in which Mr. Oselli said that the gospel had been received by him in numerous fragments at different times, at different times, from Emmanuel Swedenborg, died in the 1700s, who was seen by trustworthy clairvoyance and afterwards identified from a portrait known shown to them. The trustworthy clairvoyance was Anna Kingsford and Ed, Edward Maitland. Both were vegetarians and mystics. In fact, I think Anna Kingsford was also a physician in Britain. It says, and he received these gospels from a priest of a former century. We learned it was the sixth century. Name Placidus or, or Placidus of the Franci Franciscan order. Afterwards, a Carmelite. By them, it was translated and given to the editors in the flesh to be supplemented in their proper places were, were indicated from the four gospels or the authorized version. Revised were necessary by the same. Let me show you something else before I read this. So this argument on how the creator is still revealing things well, this, is, this comes from the argument of these mystics or Gnostics who's supposed to be getting this new knowledge. But what we find is, is that those who know something of the possibilities of mediumship or necromancy and psychic faculty will find no difficulty in believing that the text may have been given to Mr. Oselli by persons on the other side. The persons on the other side, dead, necromancy, psychic faculty, mediums, whom the Lord says stay away from. They gave Oselli this work. Here it is. You got a work that you think you're going to put on the same part of the Holy Scriptures. But it was given admittedly by 
mediums and clairvoyants. But again, to be fair, this introduction isn't in the new, it isn't in the new uh, translations of this work, of this work, or the modern writing of this work. So he said, abstaining from uh, meats and marriage. Make sure your mic's muted for me, please. Abstaining from meats and marriage, right? Now look at this, because I told you in the beginning, the Messiah in this work that he received by psychic ability, in this work, the Messiah was tempted with four temptations. The fourth temptation was a woman. Now look what it says here. Look what it says here. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I don't want to leave this one out. Because this one is also, uh, it's just, at the end of the day, it's pathetic. But uh, I just want to encourage people who's, um, who's reading through this or those who study the Bible, study the Bible. See, when we was coming up, we ain't have a bunch of this stuff. We ain't have all this internet. We ain't have touch of the button, click, everything pop up. That's, that stuff is dangerous. Study the Bible. Study the Bible first. We was advised that study the Bible before you start getting to these other books. Now look what it says in chapter nine, four temptations, not three, four, four temptations. It says, I'm gonna go right to the fourth one. And the devil places before him a woman, forbidding to marry and command to abstain from me. Remember that. But the contradiction is he said the Messiah was married at 18 years old, but his wife passed away. I'm going to show you the conclusion with this, forbidden to marry. But watch this part. The devil places him before, places before him a woman of, exceedingly, of exceeding beauty and comeliness and of subtle wit and, re and ready understanding withal. And he said unto him, take her as thou wilt, for her desire is unto thee, and thou shalt have love and happiness and comfort all thy life and see thy children's children. Yeah, is it not written? It is, is it not, or is it, it is not good for a man that he should be alone? I'm gonna skip down. This was the Messiah's, according to this gospel reply. My work is to teach and to heal the children of men. And he that is born of God keepeth his seed within him. No Mary. But the contradiction of the book said he was married at 18. But he's, now he's saying, oh, the servants of God keep this seed within him. Now, we already know that this book is dealing with vegetarianism. The last two million years says seducing spirits. Talked about them spirits sank uh, under um, Benedict's order. No marriage, no meat. Speaking of flesh. Here, we, he's building a case of no marriage. And then we're going to go to the end of the text. So I can get into some other things. I'm going to go to the end of the text. And he's going to talk about marriage. And here, chapter, in this text, it would be chapter 92. Subtitle, The Order of the Kingdom, Part 2. So he's talking about marriage. He says, but unto you, my disciples, I show a better and more perfect way. He arguing, and I don't argue with this, uh, um, monogamy. He talk about how, he talking about polygyny and uh, how many men uh, marry one wife and how many uh, women marry one man. He said, but I'm gonna show you a perfect way. But unto you, my, unto you, my disciples, I show a better and more perfect way, even this, that marriage should be, should be between one man and one woman, who by perfect love and sympathy are united, and that while love and life do, do last, 
how be it in perfect freedom. But let them see to it that they have perfect health and that they truly love each other in all purity. I'm going to skip down. Then when the time is come, let the angel or presbyter offer prayer and thanksgiving and bind them with a scarlet cord, if ye will, and crown them and lead them thrice around the altar and let them eat of one bread and drink of one cup. Where does scarlet thread stuff come from? One wife, if you're going to do that, right? So he said, you just take one wife. Y'all go through the little ritual, run around the altar with the scarlet thread. Then he say this. And if they bear children, let them, let them do so with discretion and prudence according to their ability to maintain them. In other words, you got to afford them. Nevertheless, to those who would be perfect, I'll read that again. Nevertheless, to those who will be perfect and to whom it is given, I say, let them be as the angels of God in heaven, who neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor have children, nor care for the morrow, but are free from bonds, even as I am. And keep and store up the power of God within. Don't get married. If you're going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. So the people running around talking about don't eat meat. If you believe in this gospel, you better take this step next. Don't get married. See, because y'all talking about don't eat meat. You, you're trying to reach perfection, ain't you? Well, well, you're not supposed to get married. You're not following the gospel of the Holy Scriptures. You're following the gospel of Saint, so-called Saint Benedict. And this gospel of St. Benedict has been regurgitated and has been served on a platter with the lie that had come from Emmanuel Swedenborg and St. Benedict disciple uh, St. Benedict disciple St. Placidus. If anyone have any questions or comments, I said it's open. It's open. Now, if you want me to repeat anything or if you want to comment on some of the things that we have read, it's open to you. Uh, we did read the scripture that in the latter times, Paul, our elder, argued. He told Timothy, they'll be speaking lies and hypocrisy, which you find this all through that book. Uh, he said, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. But what's interesting is this. He says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, they're gone. And that's what happens. Who and how even does this even begin to be even, even be compared to the Tanakh? Now, that was the introduction of this guy, the not marrying business, where this book originated from psychics, psychic activity. Swedenborg was dead. Placidus was dead. And so what we have here it's just as he said, in the introduction of the gospel, so-called gospel of the Holy Twelve, those who know something of the possibilities of mediumship and psychic faculty will find no difficulty in believing that the text may have been given to Mr. Oselli by persons on the other side. By persons on the other side. That's where we got it from. Now, I'm a, I want to read something else to you, too, in the scripture. So look what Ephesians said. Ephesians chapter 4. I would like to read Ephesians chapter 4. So I'm going to give you a warning. And I've heard a few people say this. 
I've talked to a couple of people for, on, on various different subjects. I remember talking to one individual about polygyny and I was arguing, well, listen, you practice polygyny, man. It's nowhere in the Torah that tell you how many wives you can have. And he let me know that through his ability and, uh, of God communicate with him in the spirit, the people in, in his group or following will know that he's been anointed by that spirit. And so basically he was telling me in a roundabout fancy way that he's going to determine it. That's it. I mean, people can sound fancy all they want to, but at the end of the day, that's all you, you were telling me. And if you're listening now, you know who I'm talking to. You, he determined it. But that's what happens when people get these new revelations. Try the spirit by the spirit. See if it is of the creator. Why is this the case? Because Ephesians chapter four tells us this. Ephesians chapter four, starting at verse 14. It says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Hamashiach or Christ, or the Christ, tossed to and fro every wind of doctrine. That's what happens when you begin to discredit the Bible and all of a sudden, your answers and revelation are going to come from somewhere else. You're being tossed to and fro. You, that's, what, that's just simply what's going to happen. And I know a lot of people young nowadays, and I know they're young and they're strong, and they feel like they're young and they're strong. You know, they're in their 20s and their 30s and carrying on, and you can't tell them nothing. You know, they know it. You know, you can't tell them now. Ain't no man going to do this from there. I, I, I ain't probably no man. I, you know, I, I'm my own person. I heard it. I got you. I got you. I got you. Go ahead and handle your business. And what I'm saying, I'm not talking about one individual person. I'm just talking about throughout time. This is what myself and uh, many other brothers on this panel right now have experienced it. And guess what? If you love, if you like it, then we gotta love it. If that's for you, that's for you. At the end of the day. But for those who are searching, we at least want because some of this stuff still might not matter. Okay, it still might not matter. Now, even though. Under the introduction itself, it teaches us that this book came forth by necromancy. It came forth by a clairvoyance and it came forth by psychics and mediums. That's how it had come about. And so look what this thing is saying now. I wanna get into some of the passage concerning it. Again, if anyone have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to... Um, uh, make a comment, okay? Um, but as I was saying, and I was quoting John, and, and, and let me do that. Let me go to John. Let me go to 1 John 4. And, uh, and I want to explain something to people too, because I made a comment for whoever's on that last discussion that we had this past first day of the week. And I want people in the school in the, in the, in the NMP to understand something. I want you to understand this clearly. You could correct me if I'm making a mistake. You could look it up. But uh, Book of First John, that's not written by John the Baptist. I want you to understand that. That's not written by John the Baptist. See, when I, when I hear stuff like that, you know what it tells me. You got to read the Bible. You got to read the Bible. Okay? First, John said, as Christ is, after he had rose, as Christ is, so are we in his world. This implies that whoever wrote 1 John was living after Christ died. John the Baptist died before Christ died. Okay? I want you to understand this. But little stuff like that is important because you have to understand and learn the psychology of or try the spirits on, what, on what's being presented to you. Some stuff may seem minute. No, these things have to be studied. So, if, you know, you got to listen. Uh, the best you can to what's being said. Listen carefully. 
And one reason why is because of this text. First John chapter four. Beloved, our elder John is explaining, beloved, believe not every spirit sent. I'll read it again. Beloved, believe not every spirit sent. Now, wait a minute now. Now, we know that this so-called gospel of the Holy Twelve, Gideon's book, you got you to be with me on this one. You got to be with me on this one because it says, uh, Oselli here in the second paragraph, the third edition, and last before the present one appeared in, our, in, our, in or about 1902 and contained a preface in which Mr. Oselli said, because he couldn't produce the manuscripts out of the Tibet monastery. So he said that the gospel, this book, this, this text, had been, had been received by him in numerous fragments at different times from Emmanuel Swedenborg, who was seen by trustworthy clairvoyants. He received the spirit. and a priest of a former century, given his name as Placidus. He received the spirit. Placidus died in sixth century. Swedenborg died in the 18th century. He received the spirit. So the, the text is saying here in John, 1 John, yeah, he received the spirit. I'm gonna read it again. People just might be just popping online. He says it here on the next page. Those who know something of the possibilities of the mediumship and psychic faculty will find no difficulty in believing that the text may have been given by, given, may have been given to Mr. Oselli by persons on the other side. See, Oselli received the spirit. And who's ever receiving his book, they're receiving a spirit. It's just written down in words. So when John say, try the spirit by the spirit, try the doctrine by the doctrine. Beloved, believe not every spirit, believe not every word, believe not everything that's coming to you. But try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Yehoshua Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Hoshua Christ has come in the flesh, is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist. I know a lot of people just think confession is just with the mouth, but we got other teachers on it, and we'll show you confession is just not with the mouth. The Messiah explains this himself, what entails confession, but we're not getting to that today. Right now, I'm trying to tell you, don't believe every spirit of sin. Now, what we have here, we got this book online telling you that you can't eat no meat. It's telling you just what Saul warned you about, that they're forbidding you to eat food that God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. That's what it says. First Timothy chapter four. So my friends, my brothers and sisters, I do not want to get carried away in it, but it's so much bad stuff in here that can be refuted, no doubt. Uh, animals become our fellows. And I understand you're supposed to take care of animals. I understand that. But they're arguing fellows on the context of if you kill them, it's like killing a man. Um, but let me just get into a few things, get down to the point of some things. Now, he argues in his text about the um, eating of meat and how it is. The Messiah post had come here in this section, chapter 51. And here he's going to butcher up. Jeremiah, he's going to take Jeremiah chapter 7 completely out of context. So the Messiah was to come on the scene and begin to say, I am going to do away with animal sacrificing and the eating of blood. This is what he told his disciples. 
They answered him. Well, in fact, let me let me go let me go down a little bit. And certain of the elders and scribes from the temple came unto him, saying, This is section 12 or verse 12 of chapter 51. Why do thy disciples teach men that it is unlawful to eat the flesh of beast? Though they were offered in sacrifice by Moses, excuse me, though they were offered in sacrifice as by Moses ordained. For it is written, God said to Noah, the fear and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the field and every bird of the air and of every fish of the sea. Into your hand, they are delivered. So he begins to explain the reply according to this text. And Jesus said unto them, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah speak of you and of your forefathers, saying, this people draw nigh unto me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching and believing and teaching for divine doctrines the commandments of men in my name, but to satisfy their own lust. So now he's arguing that the commandment of sacrificing beast and eating flesh is a commandment of men. That's why for those of you who was on our discussion last week, this idea of who changed things that was in the wind being said. I didn't get into who changed things, but I understood already through the grace of God, the argument behind it. Not only are they saying the scribes changed things, but they saying Moses did, Moses being a man. So what we have here, he said, you hypocrites, you know, how dare you, you know, uh, so look what he says after he says you're following after your own lust. Because remember, the, the argument is why are your disciples saying it is unlawful to eat flesh of beast? And he's trying to say that Moses allowed it, but you are following this because it is the doctrines of men. Watch this. As also Jeremiah bear witness when he saith concerning blood offerings and sacrifices. I, the Lord God, commanded, commanded none of these things in the day that ye came out of Egypt. But only this I commanded you to do. Righteousness, walk in the ancient paths, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. Now, see, this text made a mistake. Uh, he's actually quoting Jeremiah 7, but it, it sort of made a mistake. Uh, but it's in our behalf to show the fallacy of the, the argument of these Catholic monks. Again, it's a writing to learn and arguments, okay? But as far as scriptorial and, 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 and inspired, no, no. He made a mistake here. He says, also Jeremiah bear witness when he saith concerning blood offerings and sacrifices. He made it too general. Now watch this. We're going to read Jeremiah and see what he's trying to quote. That should be Jeremiah chapter 7. I remember dealing with this text a long time ago because this is, we were, I was under the fallacy at one time that the apostle Paul is arguing that the only thing done away with is the sacrificial law and all this other stuff. No, that's not true. That's not what Paul was saying at all. But this is one of the texts I will go to to prove that he was mainly talking about the sacrificial law because the creator didn't require the sacrificial law. And again, that's what happens when you're just taking pieces and sound bites. But when we look at it diligently, we going uh, you find that Jeremiah is actually making the argument about how the creator said that in the beginning, obey my voice. Uh, that's Jeremiah emphasis. Watch this because we're going to show you before there was a Levitical priesthood, before the book of Leviticus was set up, before the priesthood was set up, before Aaron was ordained as high priest, before all of that, the creator 
told Israel to sacrifice. Now watch this. Because now he tried to say it was the commandments of men to do sacrifice. And Moses made it up. Now watch this. This is where he's getting it from. Genesis chapter, I mean, uh, Jeremiah chapter 7. Yeah, you got a lot of people running around. See this new, see these new books. They get too, they get too deep, you see. That's what happens, I think. Cats start to think too much of themselves. They think too much of themselves. Okay. All right. Now look what Jeremiah chap chapter 7, verse 21 reads. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Put your burnt offerings unto your sacrifices and eat flesh. Now, those of us who study the Torah, we know there were a series of offerings. Burnt offerings, free will offerings, sacrifice offerings, peace offerings, different offerings. Jeremiah is arguing burnt offerings. He's bringing up burnt offerings. Now, watch this, though. I want you to show how he is being specific. This book that he received out of necromancy, this so-called gospel of the Holy 12, he just says sacrifice of blood in general. Now, I'm not even going all the way back to the beginning where the creator made the first sacrifice himself even in the garden. I'm not even going that far back today. I'm going to hit two more points and I'm going to open it up for discussion. But this is the point I feel that just to show the blatant hypocrisy of the book, I'm looking at the sacrifices aspect. And that's what I want to call. I'm going to read about two more texts and open it up for discussion. I just want to compare it to what the Torah actually says. Now, it says here, Thus saith Yehoah of hosts, the God of Israel, put your burnt offerings unto your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offering or sacrifices. Now watch. Understand what the creator is speaking to Jeremiah. I didn't command them concerning burnt offers and sacrifices, but this thing I commanded them, saying, obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. So as he's just talking about the order of it, see, I didn't, when I first brought them out of the land of Egypt, I didn't mention anything about burnt offers and sacrifices. He didn't, actually. Watch this. Watch what Jeremiah is making reference to. I, made, I said burnt offerings. I didn't say anything about sacrifices in general. I'm going to cover that in a minute, just in case you won't get confused. Because I just said, he was the first thing you told him to do was sacrifice. But right now I'm talking about the burnt offering. A little different. Now, if we go back to the book of the law, Exodus chapter 19, watch this order. And compare it to Jeremiah chapter 7. Exodus 19, excuse me. When we get to Exodus 19, and he says this, Exodus 19, starting at verse 3. And Moses went up unto Elohim, or to God. And the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, you see that? See, Jeremiah's talking about the order. And he was bringing out that order. The first thing the creator told you to do was be obedient. That's all Jeremiah is explaining. He didn't ask for sacrifices. His primary um, uh, 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 his primary goal, speaking of the creator, was to let Israel know to be obedient to his voice. You see no similitude of nothing. You just heard a voice. The cloud and, and darkness, you heard a voice. So here, this is what we find here. Exodus 19, how, what is the first thing he said? Before burnt offerings, see. Before burnt offerings, not offerings in general. 
but before burnt offerings. What did he say? Verse five, now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people of the earth, above all people, excuse me, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. You see, that's what he said first, obey my voice. That's what Jeremiah was talking about. But let's move over in the same, during the same time when he's descending, right? Next day, what did he tell him? Go to Exodus chapter 20. And this was before the book of Leviticus was written. This is before all of the sacrifice and offerings was put in order. This is before the tabernacle was built. But this isn't before he said, obey my voice. Now watch this in Exodus chapter 20. After he gave the Decalogue, look what he says. Verse 22. And the Lord said unto Moses, thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. Watch this. This is after he said, obey my voice. That's what Jeremiah was explaining. He says, an altar of earth thou shalt make unto me and shall sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, thy oxen, and all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. Not curse thee, but bless thee. Moses didn't make this up. He's telling Moses after he gave him the dialogue. This isn't no commandments of men, but the first thing, that's why they quoted, people quote Jeremiah out of context. Jeremiah was talking about, he said, put your burnt offerings to your sacrifice and eat flesh. I didn't command you to do that when you first came out of Egypt because Jeremiah's emphasis is obey my voice. Before I told you to do anything, the first commandment is obey my voice. So if you want to sacrifice, and do what you want to do, but don't do anything else I have said, then that don't work. And that was the dilemma that Israel found themselves in. Now we see the order. He said, obey my voice first. Then he began to give them the order of the sacrifice of burnt offerings and peace offerings and wherever he placed his name. Now you also heard me say, like this book says, As also Jeremiah bear witness when he saith concerning blood offerings and sacrifices. I, the Lord, commanded none of these. No, see, Jeremiah said burnt offerings according to the order of the word to be obedient was first, then the commandment for burnt offerings. But let's talk about sacrifices in general. Let's look at the sacrifices in general. We still going to stay in this book of Exodus. See, that's what happened, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You better read the Bible. That's what you better read it. First of all, you better pray and then study it. Pray to understand it. People ain't, they could barely grasp these books we got in our lap and ain't sitting up here uh, 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 mouth watering over some other books. Well, well, a question was asked me. Well, you got a lot of different books. Well, how do you know? How can you tell which ones are of God or not? That's real easy. We read it in John already. You got to try the spirit by the spirit. That's not difficult. If you read the Bible, you know that's not, that is it. You compare it. You compare what's being said to the prophets. If it don't line up with the prophets, if it don't line up with the word where it says, thus saith Yah, then you, then, then you know exactly where you put that book. It's just none other than the book of a man who's given his opinion. You can't put it on par with the word of Elohim. Now, let's leave what the word of Elohim said, though. Let's go, or the word of God. Let's see what he said. Because this book said that it was a commandment of men to do sacrifices. Here it is. Moses probably up there. He, he, he done flared from Egypt. He exiled out of Egypt. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3. He exiled out of Egypt. Probably last thing on his mind is sacrifice. He ain't thinking about that, probably. Or he could be. You know, who, who knows what he's doing over, over there in Midian? But right now we're talking about Israel. 
Now look, when we're looking at the call of the children of Israel, Exodus chapter three. And let's see if this book that was delivered to Gideon Oseli by mystics, necromancy or clairvoyancy, psychic and mediums, let's see if that spirit is right. It said the creator didn't want no sacrifice in the blood, right? Well, look. Exodus chapter three, starting at verse 18. I'll start at verse one. I mean, verse 17, excuse me. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorite and the Parasite and the Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken unto thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent, has met with us, and now let us go, we beseech thee. This is what God telling Moses to tell Pharaoh. He said, the God of the Hebrews, the Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee, three days journey into the wilderness that we may do what? Sacrifice to the Lord our, our God. Well, let's make sure that wasn't no mistake. Now, this is what God tell him. Moses is not telling the creator, so I'm going to go down here and tell him. No, the creator is telling Moses, this is what you're going to do. Flip right over to chapter five. Chapter five. Verse three. And they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with a sword. Oh, the crazy, you better get out there and sacrifice. Now, we see, I could go to a few more, all right? That's just, that's just a couple, because I said I don't want to draw it out. That's just a couple. I'll go to a few more. So we see the order. Jeremiah 7 is speaking of when he began to give them the order of obey my voice. Then later on, he gave the instructions of burnt offerings. But before all of that, before he even met with the Israelites, God told Moses, go down there and tell Pharaoh to go, let you get on out here and, and, and uh, sacrifice unto me and Moses and the elders said they got to go ahead get out get on out here and do this or a plague could come but watch this now seeing that they had to sacrifice what one of the sacrifice this is what I want the one I want to begin to close with or open it up with what was one of the sacrifices let's go to Exodus chapter 12 that they also had to do that wasn't a burn off neither was it a sac the sacrifice in the wilderness what was this one? Look at this one, Exodus chapter 12. And this was going to allow us to go back into this book of the monks who received this book, who received their revelation and, their, and, and whatever spirits or their doctrine of devils. So we could identify the doctrine of devils and know it don't, it don't stand up with the creator. Now, what was the other sacrifice? Exodus chapter 12. You all should know where I'm going with this. Exodus chapter 12. And when we get to Exodus chapter 12, I'll start reading that verse one. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel. And the Lord, and Yah spake unto Moses. Remember that. And the 10th day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little, for the lamb, let him and his neighbor and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls, every man according to his eating. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the from the sheep or from the goats, 
and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. They should do what with it? They shall eat it. Who tell them to do this? The creator telling them to do this. I know now it's just getting redundant. Now he says this, and they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. With bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, with the pertinence thereof. Why? Because that actually draws out all of the blood. After you cut them, the grill and salting actually draws out the rest of the blood out of the capillary, especially when you got them over a roasted flame. But those are another uh, teachings. So the creators commanded them to do this. 11. Verse 11, and thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, with your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is Yehoah's or the Lord's Passover. Now, he's telling them to keep it. Flip right over to Deuteronomy chapter 16. 40 years later, 40 years later, Deuteronomy chapter 16. Watch this. And then we're going to go into this text. 40 years later, Deuteronomy chapter 16. Now they're ready to go into the land of Canaan. Watch the reminder. Every now and again, truly, I don't mind doing this stuff. Uh, it's all a part of the Bible. It's all a part of the Bible. Uh, but it's just... Uh, it's just something how you have all of these people online and on Facebook and everything else running around here. There it is. I, I, I guess they're too smart, huh? Deuteronomy 16, verse 1. Observe the month of Abib. Keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord thy God brought thee out of Egypt by night. He's repeating the instructions he received from the Creator. In Exodus 12, Moses didn't make it up. This isn't a commandment of men. God told Moses to tell him, go down there and sacrifice to me in three days. I want you to have a sacrifice unto me. God told Moses, Elohim told Moses, I want you to take this lamb. I want you to kill it. I want you to eat it. Now he says this, thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God, verse 2 of the flock and of the herd in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. And there shall be no leavened bread seen with thee in all thy coasts seven days, Neither shall there, neither shall there anything of the flesh which thou sacrificest the first day at evening remain all night until the morning. You better eat the flesh. And whatever flesh is left over, you have to have it devoured by the flame. But at the end of the day, you got to eat flesh. That's what you got to do. See, Oselli messed up. Because he didn't study the Torah. That's not what they do. He have in his book that the so-called historical Jesus of Nazareth said had he come to abolish the eating of sacrifices and blood. The Jews didn't eat blood. But, but that's what he have in here. He come to do away. He didn't have to do away with the eating of blood because they didn't do that anyway. He got another account in his book where one of the people, while he was on this mission, one of the people follow him, brought a cage full of uh, 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 rabbits and birds. Rabbits. Well, the, the historical genes wasn't eating no rabbits. Well, he said, let the rabbits go. 
to be fair, the book said, let the rabbits go. But no, no Israelite going to be bringing no rabbit in a cage to be eaten anyway. But this happens when the people don't study the Torah uh, closely. Now, we get it in chapter uh, 51 that according to this text, the elders confronted him saying, why did that your disciples teach men that is unlawful to eat flesh of the beast? Now, I want to skip over to this Passover business and I'm going to open it up because there's so much stuff here that we can go into that uh, uh, it, it will be here for a long time. I don't want to spend that much time on it because of some other stuff I do want to cover for the sake of it. Those of you who was in a discussion this last week, I had mentioned Isaiah uh, chapter 11, and you may have heard me say I will deal with Isaiah later through the grace of God. We will deal with it later. And uh, again, because uh, that language in, uh, in Isaiah is a figurative language, and I want to, well, from my understanding, to be fair, it's a figurative language, and I want to present the case why using the scriptures to show you the language of the Hebrews and why and how it's constantly used and the animals that were constantly used that you find in Isaiah chapter 11 and other texts. That's what that's why I mean we have to carefully read the Bible. And I want to build a case to show you that. But first, in this, what we're putting on here for people who probably we run across other people who's arguing about this gospel of the Holy Twelve. And, and, and veganism and, or vegetarianism, okay? He didn't go too far, even in his book later on. See, he didn't believe in drinking either, okay? So he didn't, he didn't harp on that too much. But watch this. Uh, this is the Last Supper. And this is a common mistake of the Protestants. They believe that the Messiah was eating the Passover that night. And I know a lot of people call themselves Israelites believe that too, but we don't. He was eating supper. He wasn't eating the Passover lamb. But this text says that they were keeping the Passover, but he didn't eat the lamb. Now we just read in the book of the law that he had to keep the lamb. In fact, in this text, it alludes to this as well that even the Messiah's parents, it says that I'll probably find it before we close out if people have questions, that his parents did not observe the Passover according to their brother. They did it another way. But watch this discourse. Chapter 75, verse four, and Jesus said, with desire, I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer and to institute the memorial of my oblation for the service and salvation of all. I'm gonna skip down some. Now watch the Judas Iscariot role in this text. And, Ju and, and Iscariot said unto him, Master, behold, the unleavened bread. That's not what our gospels in our, that we have in our King James. That night, it doesn't say unleavened bread. It says bread, Greek artos. Here it says, and Iscariot said unto him, Master, behold the unleavened bread, the mingled wine and oil and the herbs. Remember, he had to eat it with bitter herbs. But Judas is asking, he says, but Master, where is the lamb that Moses commanded? You see, as he keeps saying Moses commanded it. Thus, he's making an argument, the commandments of men. And so Oselli and the rest of them trying to make this argument. Well, Moses gave you the, 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 the writing of divorcement. No, I, I, I've heard that before. Trying to defend this. So I'm not picking at a particular person. I've heard this before. And we have, I have read through it. So what it's saying is, where is the lamb Moses commanded? For Judas had bought the lamb, but Jesus had forbidden that it should be killed. Wait a minute. If he did that, then guess what he would have been? A sinner. He would have broke the Torah. He said, Jesus forbid that it should be killed. And John spake in spirit, saying, Behold the Lamb of God, 
the good shepherd, which giveth his life for the sheep. How this gonna happen? How did this gonna happen? He's quoting John the Baptist. He don't say John the Baptist, but this is what John the Baptist said, behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. John spake in spirit saying, behold the lamb of God, the good shepherd, which giveth life, giveth his life for the sheep. John the Baptist was dead at this time. So maybe he's saying it's another John. What are they saying? You ain't got to eat no lamb no more. This before he, you better off making this argument after he rose. But to make the argument before he was actually executed, now you're saying he's a sinner. Watch this. It doesn't end there, though. But again, Judah said, Master, is it not written in the law that a lamb must be slain for the Passover within the gates? Verily I say unto you, for this end have I come into the world, that I may put away all blood offerings and the eating of flesh, of the beast and of the birds that are slain by men. That's why in Oselli's book, after the Messiah rose from the dead, he's seen uh, 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 brothers out there, uh, the elders to us out there fishing. He said, you caught any, anything, children? They said, no. But what did he have on the beach? He had broiled fish and honeycomb, broiled fish and honeycomb. But through the spirits that spoke to Oselli, he didn't have broiled fish. He had clusters of grapes. See, through the spirit that spoke to Oselli through psychic and mediums, the Messiah didn't even help. He don't even mention about the Messiah getting a fish in a boat or telling his disciples, go back out there and get them fish. You're going to get a lot of them too. Go back out there. Because they didn't even want to go back out there. He told them to go on back out there. Hey, if he come with a new way, he should have said, good, y'all want to go back out there. Come follow me. But he didn't say that. He said, go back out there. See, Oselli, through the mediums, that he was speaking to left that out. But now the dividing of the loaves, no fish, Oselli mediums and the psychics and the faithful clairvoyants, they said, no, there was clusters of grapes. And who the, who the hell you gonna believe? Who you gonna believe? I argue that this doctrine came straight out of none other than the spirits of devils. And to learn how the spirits of devils operate is one thing. I'm not reading this for doctrine. I'm not reading this to support this as a doctrine that we should follow. I'm reading this to show you how cunning the devil works. That's why I hold this literature. To show that the Bible reigns supreme all the time. Now it's said that you must eat that lamb. You got to eat it. Here he's saying, no, you don't. Verse 11. Not by shedding innocent blood. In fact, let me read up again because I skipped some. In the beginning, God gave to all the fruits of the trees and the seeds and the herbs for food. But those who loved themselves more than God or their fellows corrupted their ways and brought disease into their bodies and fill the earth with lust and violence. But God said you can eat the meat. There is nowhere in the Bible where it says you can't eat meat. Why not? If it goes through the trouble to tell you what meat you can't eat, why you can't find a word where it says you can't eat no meat? Speaking of flesh. Because just as he said in Timothy, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Forbidding people to abstain from foods which God have received, which God have given to be, to be received with thanksgiving. Benedict began to change the rule in the sixth century. And according to Oselli, Benedict's disciple came to him by way of medium and gave him this, this teaching. Abstain from me. And marriage. That's what we read earlier. So when we see this here, all creatures live in God and God is in and is in hid, is hid in them. 
right? Now, let me close with this part because it wasn't over for Judas. Now, Judas upset because they're not eating the lamb. In this text, they make Judas look like he's the one really trying to keep the law. And now in this text, showing that the Messiah is the transgressor of the law. So Judas running to Caiaphas like he could just go to Caiaphas' house. That's how when you read the Bible idealistically, man, Judas couldn't, Judas, he couldn't just run up to Caiaphas' palace. Not that I know of. They were the high authorities. I know Paul can do it. I didn't know if Judas having them kind of connections. But nevertheless, this text says that Judas went to see Caiaphas. Now watch this. Now Judas Iscariot had gone to the house of Caiaphas and said unto him, Behold, he, speaking of Jesus, has celebrated the Passover within the gates with the matzah in place of the lamb. I indeed bought a lamb. But he forbade that it should be killed. And lo, the man of whom I bought it is witness. So Judas said, I bought the lamb. But Jesus wouldn't let us, he wouldn't eat it. And Caiaphas rent his clothes and said, truly this is a Passover of the law of Moses. He have done the deed which is worthy of death, for it is a weighty transgression of the law, what need of further witness? Caiaphas and tore up his clothes. He's going to tear up his clothes again a little later because I don't know how many garments he got, but he showed up tearing up a bunch of stuff. He's going to tear up his clothes a little bit later when uh, the Messiah is in court. Now, before he in court, this book got him tearing up his clothes because the Messiah wasn't going to eat the Passover. But the book of the law say he got to eat the Passover. And it also says he's the lamb. He, 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 didn't, he didn't transgress. So somebody lying. And like I said, I can go through a whole bunch of other stuff. But I'm going to open it up if anyone have any questions or comments. If anyone have any questions or comments on our discussion tonight. Uh, Shalom, brother. Shalom, shalom, bro. What you got? Because I know you have some things you wanted to say. <laughs> First of all, that was an excellent breakdown that you just gave there. And, and you gave some further detail than what I had about the, the, the authors. Um, the author of this book and where he got the revelations and all of that from. So I thank you for that. I can add that to my arsenal. But, you know, all this week, ever since the meeting that we had, this week I've been reading or listening to that book, you know, because it's you can listen to the audio of it on YouTube. And I've been listening to that book, and man, that is a that's a hard listen. To those of us that know the language, and I'm not speaking dialect, but to those of us that know the language of the prophets and the text and the disciples, man, come on, man. That book, this book don't even fit. And then to change things, change things around like he changed them. Okay, like, for instance, one of the instances where the scriptures say, <clears throat> where the gospels say, that Mary, when she was pregnant, they went to the inn and had uh, the Christ in the manger. Well, this, this, this man says that they were in a cave. Well, with doves in the, and they said he was born in the winter. So you in a, in a cave in the winter with doves <laughs> and other animals, bro, can doves survive winter temperatures? I don't think so. Not like that. I don't think they'd be in no crave doing it, but. Right, right, right. But <laughs> see, to those that don't know the language, and we're not talking about Hebrew, Greek, now we we talking about the spiritual language of how the texts were written, even after translation, the texts were written, what they meant, what they meant when they said this, this, and that. His language just does not fit. And you know how, how else I look at it, what I think what happened with, with him? He he <clears throat> he said that like you brought out tonight, that he was inspired by 
revelations from this other priest, right? Mm -hmm. No, you wasn't. All you did was took the four gospels, combined them together, and added and took out what you wanted. Mm -hmm. Because as I listen, you can hear the gospel message as, as written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, whoever those writers are. You can hear those, the gospels, but at certain points and the points that he wanted to make, he would carve them out, leave stuff out, add in stuff like the grapes instead of the fish. Come on, man. I, who falls for that? Those that are not weaned from the breast. <laughs> those who are still on the milk. That's right. And That's so right. That, that, that there, you know, so I'm glad you did this tonight. And I'm going to share this all over the place because this message is definitely spreading with this doctrine or whatever it is. It's definitely spreading amongst the so-called whoever considers themselves to be Hebrews. This is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. So I'm glad that you gave a, 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 a sword that we could fight even further with. So I, I thank you for that and all praises to the Most High for leading you to do so. I yield on all praises. And here's the other part here. He said the original gospel says, this is the introduction of the older version. If you want to see these excerpts of the older version, that version that isn't in the new publishing, you go to Internet Archive. It's, it's so old, it's free. Internet Archive, Gospel of the Holy 12 PDF. And the original gospel says Mr. Oselli in, in his preface is preserved in one of the Buddhist monasteries in Tibet where it was hidden by some of the Essenes community. And they were never able to find it. So therefore, he received these things through his so-called uh, revelation, his so-called revelation. And let me just throw one more else thing in there. If somebody wants to say something, please do, uh, because we are online. So the feedback will be helpful. So we won't have those, um, those silent areas. But chapter 46, uh, the transfiguration on the mount, the giving of the law. It says, verse 7, and Jesus said unto them, behold, a new law I give unto you, which is not new, but old. He's getting this from John, 1 John, when John argued it, is, is new but not new. Even as Moses gave the Ten Commandments to Israel after the flesh, you see, he said, Moses gave the Ten Commandments of Israel to Israel after the flesh. That's not the case. They received the Decalogue from the voice that came from the mount. So also I give unto you the twelve for the kingdom of Israel after the spirit. So now he's given new commandments. Now notice this new commandment. Now. Hear, O Israel, Jehovah, thy God, that's how he's spelling, J-O-V-A, is one. Many are my seers and my prophets. In me all live and move and have subsistence. Ye shall not, notice this, notice how he's setting it up. Ye shall not Take away the life of any creature for your pleasure, nor for your profit, nor yet tormented. Verse 12, ye shall not eat the flesh, nor drink the blood of any slaughtered creature. So these are the new commandments he's given. And But we read before in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 12, in fact, let me just read it for the record for those of who those who's listening. And I want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 12, just for the record. For those of you who may listen in, in the habit on this recording, because it's just this, this is just bad. That's all. There's really no other word for it. It's just bad. Or some would say, this is sorry. Let, let's 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 go into Deuteronomy chapter 12. And uh I believe I want to start reading at verse 15 because he's talking about he doing away with the eating of flesh. Nowhere in the Bible, in the entire Bible, did it say you couldn't eat flesh. Nowhere. Uh it tells you what flesh you can eat, what flesh you can't eat. 
Okay. Now it's a whole lot of other things we can get into with this, uh, but I'm not getting into it tonight. Um, I just want to get to these points. Um, it says here, sometimes just trying to focus on that because it's just so much there. That's an error. But, you know, I, I'm trying to do my best. Deuteronomy chapter 12 and 15. I'll start from a little higher. Uh, verse 13. It says, take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place thou seest. So he's arguing about the order of the burnt offerings, which we looked at briefly earlier, right? We we're looking at those burnt offerings earlier. So now watch this. We're going to get something else out of this. Hold on one second. So now he says, take heed that you don't offer in every place thou seest, but in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of thy tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings. And there thou shalt do all that I command thee. See, this isn't from Moses. This is from the creator, number one. But watch this other part about the eating of flesh because he said he gave a new commandment from his psychic uh, mediums that, that given according that he said he got from him. But as my brother brought out tonight, no, he didn't. He came up with his own mind, his own experience, changed some things according to his vegetarian beliefs. So he said in verse 14, but in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of thy tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command thee. Notwithstanding, thou may notwithstanding though, thou mayest kill and eat flesh in all thy gates. So if it's not for a sacrifice to bring to the altar, in your gates you can kill and eat flesh. Whatsoever thy soul lusts after according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. This is a blessing. He's not giving this to you for a curse. You can't compare this to the quails in Egypt when they complain. It wasn't about the quails. It was about the complaining. So here where he's blessing them, oh, you can eat it, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. The unclean and the clean may eat thereof, as of the roebuck and as of the heart. Whether you clean or unclean, you can eat of this. Only ye shall not eat the blood. Ye shall pour it upon the earth as water. Now, so this goes back to Genesis 9. But this said he's coming with a new command. You can't eat flesh. So I just wanted to put those records out there for people. At the end of the day, you could take it a leap. But here it is. You know, and I may do a little playlist so we can hook it up with this Book of Mormons because. They ran off with that too. That Book of Mormons, they definitely run, ran off with that too. But right here, we're looking at this here. And uh, I, I don't, I, I probably didn't get that clip. Um, but uh, Oselli himself began to explain that um, how, he's, how he was receiving these things, how the spirit was, according to him, poured out on him. Um, but again, if anyone want to make any comments about what we have been discussing tonight, please. Hey, hey, I want to say one more thing. Yeah, go for it. Go ahead. I want to say first, uh, also, let me put this on the record for those who may be listening later. It's very noble for you to take the time out to do this study when you don't eat anything from an animal at all. Oh, yeah, you're bringing that up. All right, yeah, yeah, right, okay. Right, so, so, you know, that's a very noble call because truth is truth. Your decision not to eat meat or flesh or anything from an animal does not come from uh, um, the point that this guy here is trying to make. Right. To where it's, it's wickedness or it's a sin. No, no, you have decided within yourself that this is what you wouldn't do. But you also know what the scriptures say, That's because right. this, because this book here, somebody has to be a liar. When you pick up this book, somebody has to become a liar. And so oftentimes what I've seen is individuals who pick up this book. Moses becomes a liar. Mm -hmm. Jesus becomes a liar. And, a and Paul definitely becomes a liar that needs to burn in hell.
Mm -hmm. You know, so, mm -hmm. but, but all the while, the author of this book, <laughs> he gets off scot-free. <laughs> he get off scot-free. How does that happen? And How where? does that happen? How? And where? So, you know, again, so I thank you again for this. And I'm, I'm going to shut my mic down for others that might want to come in and, and have something to say. Yes. Anybody want to say something concerning this or, or something? Uh, yes. I mean, uh, even if people feel they agree. Uh, hey, wait. So he was getting a lot of this stuff from uh, from the Tibetan monk? No. He lied. And this is the introduction mm -hmm. of the old version that I got up here. You all could see the screen, right? Yeah. Okay. You can see the screen I got up. I just want to make sure I am screen sharing. Can you see this thing I got up here? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. So this is the introduction of the older book. He argued that he originally, this text originally came from an Essene community. Here in this third paragraph, the original gospel said, the original gospel says Mr. Oselli in his preface is preserved in one of the Buddhist monasteries in Tibet. That was his argument at first where it was hidden by some of the Essenes community. I don't even know if they ever even found the gospels we know ever among the Essenes, ever. I don't even, I don't even know that to be true. That the gospel, that the Essenes ever even had a gospel of the so-called New Testament. But this is where he said a, 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 a monastery in Tibet. But then he changed, but then people asked him to produce the manuscripts. So therefore it became this. Because I was thinking how the uh, Buddhist monks, the Buddhist that, monks. Yeah, he could the whole not even animals. I was thinking about how in a, in a Buddhist religion they get into not eating animals because of the spirits of animals and yes. things of that sort. And so I just thought there was a connection there, but okay, okay, it's cleared out now. Yeah, but it is to him because that's where he's that's why in the beginning of the book he said Jesus went to uh India, you know, he traveled through all of these different places in the east. So that that teaching he, he set it up in the beginning of the book that the Messiah will have that sentiment. But like he says here, what we pointed out in the beginning, the third edition and the last before the present one appeared in about 1902 and contained a preface in which Oselli said that the gospel had been received by him. Now, he, this is his other argument. He received this work in numerous fragments at different times from Emmanuel Swedenborg. Oselli uh, was born in 1835. Swedenborg died in the 1700s. He, he ain't never met the man. And that's what they're showing us here. He received the fragments in different times from Emmanuel Swedenborg. But Emmanuel Swedenborg was seen, since he was dead, he was seen by trustworthy clairvoyance and afterwards identified from a portrait shown to them. And then he also said he received it from uh, Placidus, who was a student of um, Benedict. When Benedict started the whole rule of don't eat no meats and don't marry. So Placidus was a disciple of Benedict. Placidus, he died in the sixth century. So it was these two who he claimed came to him through, as he said on the next page, uh, pretty much mediums and psychic faculties. So he, he explains where it actually comes from. But according to him, but, you know, when you read it, you would just find out. No, he just pretty much looked through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he began to um, alter the text with his own understanding of things. That's, that's what he did. In fact, he must have been a, it must have been a problem because the, the Catholic Church themselves, they suspended him. And they actually kicked him out for a while. But uh, yeah, that's that on that. That's the explanation okay. on that. Um, okay. Was someone else going to say something before then? I wasn't sure if I had to cut somebody off. Uh, no, um, I wasn't going to say that, but I would like to say something real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, shalom, greetings to everyone. 
Um, one of the things that I thought that was interesting um, as you first started to present is um, not as you first started to present, but like in the middle of the presentation, you had mentioned uh, something to the effect of uh, like a conflict when people say that they led by the spirit. And that's something, man, because like, you know, when you read Joshua and then later on Samuel comes and then later on, uh, you know, uh, Elijah comes and so forth, and all of the prophets agree. But everybody that says that they have these revelations from these spirits that they call, that say that they say that they, these spirits are from God, and they say that God, when they when they say God, I'm assuming they're talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of course. But they say God gave them this revelation. I hear it on Clubhouse. I hear it on YouTube. All these, you know, whatever. But when they have these revelations, it's always something to throw the whole text, the whole Bible, you know, out of out of whack. And I, you know, I remember, I'm not sure exactly what book it is, but I know the scripture says that God is not the author of confusion. And it's something how they always got these spirits or these, these uh, revelations that brings in confusion. You know, like, you know, Joshua agreed with Samuel. You know, Moses agreed with, I mean, excuse me, Joshua agreed with Moses and vice versa and so forth and so on. The apostles agreed with Malachi, but these cats today, they come up with these revelations that they they claim from whatever spirit, but it doesn't agree with the apostles and the prophets. That's just, it's interesting to me. I think that right there is something that we all should be aware of. All right, whatever, you know, revelation you have, do, you know, when we try the spirit according to the word, do it agree. And if it don't agree, if it's trying to say that the apostles is wrong, if it's trying to say that the prophets are wrong, no, something is wrong with whatever you're bringing to the table. And I think that, um, if, if we if we don't use that as our measuring stick with the with the laws of the prophets say what the apostles say then we'll always find ourselves in some type of confusion or a bad predicament but um you know it's, I, I guess there's nothing more else to say you know because i again god is not the author of confusion so whenever you bring in a doctrine and it's trying to twist it nah man that ain't that ain't it that's something different but uh, i use you know to get away from it and he's not honest in here he left stuff out and like we talked about Sunday um, or the first day of the week in chapter 35, I want to put this on for the record for those who may listen to this. In chapter 35 of this text, uh, the good law, or excuse me, the good law, the good Samaritan, Mary, Martha on divine wisdom. And that's why in this book, I didn't get into the debt, get into them a lot, but you know, they call his reference to the creator is mother, father, or father, mother, God. Uh, or I, you know, or the son daughter. Uh, hey, right. That's another thing. That's yeah. a definite throw off. Yes. Like they, they caught me off rip. Like, yes. That's mysticism. Mysticism. All day Eastern long. Mysticism. That's right. Right. Mysticism. That's mysticism all day long to, mm -hmm. to, to compare it and to, you know, to drop that term mother, father. So yep. when somebody says that, uh, my, my right eyebrow automatically go up. Cause I, cause I kind of know what angle you're trying to direct from. That's right. That's right. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but no, go no, no, good. This is it. This is the stage for it. I mean, I just want feedback myself. I, I'm gonna read this part just to show the dishonesty of him uh, as we compare um, Proverbs nine and two, because he says here in chapter thirteen, uh, "Verily I say unto you, wisdom buildeth her house and hewn out her twelve pillars." But in the Proverbs, it actually says seven. It says, she doth prepare her bread and her oil and mingle her wine. She doth furnish her table. She standeth upon the high places of the city and crieth to the sons and daughters of men. Whosoever will, let him turn and hither. Let them eat of my bread and take of my oil and drink of my wine. Now, when you read it, that's one thing. But uh, do anyone have that Proverbs right on deck? You, do you happen to have a, any, anybody got Proverbs or Bible right next to them? If not, don't worry about it. I'm going to do it right now if you don't. I just wanted to read them both at the same time. Say that one more time, Elder. Proverbs 9, and, Proverbs 9 and 1. You got your Bible? Yes, sir. Let me grab it. Okay. Now watch this. Because this, I just want to read this while he's, get, just to show the dishonesty of him. So here he's saying, verily wisdom, uh, he's quoting uh, Proverbs, paraphrasing Proverbs 9 and 2. 
So he said, wisdom buildeth her house and hewn her pillars, even though he says 12, well, I'll give him that. She doth prepare her bread and her oil and mingle her wine. She doth furnish her table. But he left out something. Would you read to us Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, and let's see what he left out. Yes, sir. This is the book of Proverbs, chapter 9 and verses 1. Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beast. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. I'm going to read his again. Verily I say unto you, wisdom buildeth her house, and he without her twelve pillars. She doth prepare her bread and her oil and mingle her wine. She doth furnish her table. He just left it out. He left it out. So this is beyond the so-called New Testament argument. Now he's saying Proverbs is corrupted then because Proverbs got mingled her beast. Is that what that say? That's what it says. Verses two, she so, had killed her beast. Yes. So, so this mess feels it, it, it. That's why I say what book you want to use. It don't matter. Whatever Tanakh you want to use. You want to use the interlinear? What version you want to use? You want to use the Septuagint? What, what, what do you want to use? Because they all, all, there is no record of Proverbs leaving that out. There is no record in any book, any version, any of them that says eat anything other than the lamb. There's nowhere in there that says Moses in the Tanakh where it says Moses made up these sacrifices. But please, somebody give us a little feedback on what they think about what we're looking at tonight. No feedback, huh? Nobody got nothing to say about it. Are y'all still? Thinking on it. What we got here. And like I said, I do I want to go into the Isaiah, but I'm not doing that tonight because I don't want to waste no time, wait, uh uh skip anything. I want to take our time and look at that Isaiah 11. But um if anybody have anything to add, what I'm gonna do to continue our session, uh our brothers and sisters on YouTube, we're gonna get ready to close out. Hopefully we have enough information um, for those of you who's running into people who's arguing about this so-called gospel by Gideon Oseli and how it, it contradicts the entire, it contradicts the entire Tanakh, the law, the prophets. So hopefully we went through some stuff tonight and there's other stuff in here we could read and people build their arguments off of assumptions and um, so our position on Genesis and in the beginning, we argue that it's progressive. So to argue that none of this stuff, first of all, to argue in Genesis, to take it to Genesis real quick, to argue that uh, silence is prohibition is just a faulty way of reasoning. That is the base of animals and men. Um, and for the record, before we get into Isaiah, I will let you know there is a difference between straw and grass. Um, I'm letting you know as we get into Isaiah. It's a very interesting study, but uh, grass, lions do eat grass, just like dogs, but that's not the base of their diet. They're not, their anatomy isn't built that way. Um, we could get into idealism in other ways, but I'm not getting into it at this moment. Um, uh, but the book is progressive. So if you say all of this has happened after the flood, then that means we're enclosed and a whole bunch of other laws. You can get into a whole bunch of other laws that we probably will be able to do or not do uh, because it all happened after the flood. Okay, a lot of things, mankind life began to fold out. And as God began to reveal more knowledge, you begin to see the progression. It's not that he was going to pro prohibit it, it was just a process of time. So clothing, for example, and I know, I know there's doctrines. I've heard it. There's doctrines out there that we shouldn't even have to wear clothes. And the kingdom, everybody be naked, you know, chain on this new different body, ain't got to wear no clothes. Well, um, 
Some argue that you, you know, that's wrong. That's after the fall. All right. But if you take that argument, it's a lot of stuff that you're going to undermine yourself with because a lot of stuff come after the flood or excuse me, after the, um, the, uh, the fall. But as I was saying, you can't take silence as prohibition. It didn't never say you couldn't eat honey. It didn't say you could, you know, it doesn't say, you know, you're going to eat milk or butter. It doesn't say any of that, you know, so people imply so much in Genesis. We're so little, little is given and they don't look at the entire book. Or some may not realize how the Bible itself is progressive. Now, they not only make that mistake in Genesis, but they also make that mistake in the book of the law with the rise of Israel as well. They sort of compartmentalize the Bible and make it stationary. And they don't realize it's a progressive work, just like life itself. Everything is progressing, leading one to another. So if you want to know more about that, feel free to give us a call. We will explain it. Uh, to you as far as our positions to show you even the Genesis argument in Genesis chapter one, don't, don't stand up to scrutiny. Uh, but for the brothers and sisters who are on YouTube, we're going to close out and we will uh, finish our discussion here on a Zoom call if anyone have anything to add to the discussion. All right. So I'm going to close this one out and then we'll leave this room open for a little while.